Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Here are your hosts, Lucas Musialski and Leo Severino. Hello and welcome to the 11th episode of the Wall Street Lab podcast. As you might have noticed from the title, this episode is a special episode. We will be throwing these kind of episodes from time to time in between our main interviews. So if you are a newcomer to our podcast, we would highly recommend that you go back and revisit our previous episodes where we have conversations with financial and business professionals in very specific fields where we discuss with them what they do and how they do it. We would especially recommend the two previous episodes it's the one how to get into investment banking with Ian Morgan and the one prior to that with Alexander Dahl, the CEO of Barclays Germany. This will give you a pretty good look at what we do normally. This week, however, we have decided to throw in an episode by ourselves where we discuss certain topics. And the, you can expect these kind of episodes from time to time in between the main shows. Actually, we got some requests from listeners. They were wondering whether we would ever have an episode where we, we just talk about ourselves a little bit. And I think this might be, we will be able to find out more about what we've been up to. As this episode is the special episode and we've been receiving a lot of requests from you guys to tell you something about ourselves and what we have been up to before starting the Wall Street Lab. As a matter of, of background, we both met when we were studying towards our master's in finance degrees at Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. And Leo previously studied in the US and worked in hedge funds. I personally worked in a few different areas of finance before and now we both work in, in private equity and both are audiobooks and podcast addicts so this is something for us to to create of our own exactly for this episode we thought we would talk about something that a lot of us in finance are interested in which is continuing education we've had an, an episode that where we interviewed the director of exams for the kaya association dr nelson lacy and today we thought we would talk about the CFA designation. Yes, exactly. And as far as this topic goes, we have a great opportunity on our hands here today because I might be considered a very junior exam taker in comparison to Leonardo here as he is a CFA as well as a Kaya charter holder and everything in the first try. So, well, who better to turn to advice and at this point I think it will be pretty difficult to to find someone who has learned more towards exams. Yeah, and I remember when we were in school, a lot of our colleagues used to ask me about the CFA exams and they used to ask me about tips and things to do, things to watch out for. So we thought that this might be very helpful to especially those of you who are starting out in finance. So we thought we would do something a little different than what you see in online forums where people talk about how to tackle a specific topic of the exam. So we thought we would talk specifically about tactics. So what are some of the things that you can do practically in during your study program that might increase your chances of, of passing the CFA exams? And it's very important for me to emphasize the fact that these tips are things that worked for me. So these are things that I did when I was studying for the exams, but people are different, I understand that. So I think that some of these things might not apply to some of you. So I put together a list of 18 tips that I thought really helped me in my study efforts back in the day. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna be talking about each of them and just try to make it as conversational as possible and hopefully uh, add some value to you guys. Also, please feel free to apply this, these tips to any sort of exam. It doesn't have to be CFA. I find this, I find this list that you have, that you have prepared to be very useful towards any kind of studying that, that you might be doing. We also wanted to use these short episodes to 
give you a short update on our activities and what we're up to with the Wall Street Lab. So before we jump into the interview, we wanted to say that we have just reached 10,000 downloads, which we we're very, very happy about. And we would love to thank you guys for, for listening very much. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a lot more, a lot quicker than we expected. So thank you guys. Uh, we're really happy to know that there are actually some people who uh, spend their commutes with us every two weeks. So we're glad that we're able to bring some some good content to you guys. And it, it just helps us stay focused and try to bring you as much good content as possible in the future. In addition to that, we also have some pretty awesome episodes prepared for you already. And you can expect us to be on a regular track of interviewing senior investment business professionals in two weeks. Also, there are a few outside projects that we're, that we're currently working on in, um, in connection to the Wall Street Lab. You can probably expect a, a forum coming up soon where you can share your, share your thoughts. And I think this will be, this will be a good community. Uh, that we could create for people to to talk about finance and uh, careers and business. Yeah, definitely. I think you know this platform, this podcast, has been a good way for us to get to know a lot of really, really interesting people. So we thought. I mean, we at the very beginning we thought we would create sort of a small community. It doesn't have to be big. But having an actual forum on our website might help spark some interesting conversations. And we hope that some of the people that we've interviewed and some of those that we are to interview in the future will engage in those conversations and, and add value to you guys as well. So you can probably expect that in the, in the near future. We will let you know in the, in the next podcast how the, how the preparations for this are going. So let's just jump into the topic, Leo. Why don't we start, why don't we start off with, you have prepared 18 points. Right. I'll try to go through these quickly. Otherwise, this podcast is going to be very long. So we'll try to keep it at about an hour as, as our usual podcast. So let's go with number one, understand your why. What I mean by that is you need to understand why you're taking the CFA exams. If your reason for taking them is because uh, you want to get a job, that might not be a good enough reason because after you get a job, what will be your motivation? And, you know, this is a long term process. You know, if you pass all th three exams at first try, it's, it's a two and a half to three year commitment. So I would make sure that your reasons for taking the exam is more long term than that. Uh, when I talk about my reason, uh, the, the reason why I, I wanted to take the CFA exams was because a professor of mine back in the day when I was doing my undergrad, he said that the CFA exam is probably the hardest exam you can take in finance. So that was, that was my motivation. You know, someone told me it was hard and I wanted to see if I could pass them. So it was a long-term goal for me and it really helped me stay focused during the three years. So so make sure you understand why you're taking them. I, I don't think it's a good idea for us to, to tackle the question of what the CFA is good for, because I know that people have different opinions about where should, be, should you be using the CFA, where and what areas of finance it's more important. So I'd leave that to the online forums. You can Google that. You can find enough information on that. But from a personal perspective, just make sure you understand why you're doing it. There are very many answers to, to this question, but I think we can, we can just say that it can be beneficial in any area of, of finance and it would always be considered an asset. Definitely. Definitely. So let's go to number two, shall we? Yeah. So create a study habit. This is a very important one because any new thing that you try to do that is mildly unpleasant, like studying. At the very beginning, it's studying or, or exercising or trying to eat better. You know, it's something that at the very beginning, it's, 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 it's daunting. It's not fun until you create a habit. And then after you create a habit, it starts becoming enjoyable. As sick as it sounds, studying starts becoming enjoyable. So I would try to find time, even if at the very beginning, you're not very motivated to try to find at least 10 minutes to open your books and read them every single day. It doesn't matter if it's before work, if it's during your lunch break, uh, after work, during your commute. Uh, just try to find a specific hour of the day where you sit down and try to try to study. There is a, a very good book that we've both read. 
And we would definitely recommend you read it if you want to learn more about the power of habit. And that's the that's the title of of the book, the power of habit. I don't remember the name of the author. Yeah, yeah, but you can easily Google that. It's a it's very it's a very popular book. Great book, tremendous, tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> right. The other thing is, I've tried to create a a morning routine for myself, and I realize that a morning routine starts with an evening routine because if you're not going to bed at the right time, you're not going to be able to wake up early to do whatever it is you want to do, exercise or study or whatever it is. So so that's all in, in the book as well. Completely agreed. And what I found very useful personally is maybe if you can figure out a way to get to the office early before anyone else, let's say at a crazy time of 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., and then just study before you start working at 9. This is also very helpful because if you don't turn on your computer, there is nothing else you can do, nothing else to distract you from actually studying. So I found this a method that actually works for me. Yeah, that's true. I remember I used to stay late in the office after work. So I would stop working at about 5.30 every day and everyone would leave and I would stay in the office for another two to two and a half hours from Monday through Friday. And it was a very productive time. I understand that some of our listeners may have a life uh, or not. What I meant is <laughs> <laughs> what I what I meant is, you know, some some of some of you guys might work from, you know, eight in the morning until night at night. If you're in investment banking, then you might not have that kind of time. So, again, that was my experience. And I think you guys have to figure out how how to best apply that to your own to your own situation. So number three. Yeah. Plan your study journey to the smallest detail. What I mean by that is before you start studying, so before you even open the first page of the book, sit in front of your computer, and I used Google Calendar when I did this, and I opened book by book and went through each uh, learning outcome statement. That's what the individual uh, sub-segments of the readings are called. And I would go into my Google Calendar and I would write down every single learning outcome statement in its respective date. So I would know, okay, it's January 25th. I'm supposed to be at learning outcome statement number 10, for example. And I would do that for all the six books. So I would know exactly when I would stop studying and when I would start reviewing. And that would also give me the chance to figure out, okay, am I going to take a day, a week to just review what I've studied? So it gives you a lot of control over your study plan. So even if you're not considered a detail-oriented person, I think planning your study efforts to the smallest detail possible is a really powerful thing because it really makes you, I mean, it made me try to stick to my plans. So that's definitely something I'd, I'd recommend. So there are also a lot of tools that you can use in order to plan for your study. If it's if it's a CFA exam, if it's a CHIA exam or any other, there are usually tools that will allow you to, you would put in the date of the exam and the date that it is today. And this tool would allow you to divide different topics and so you would see how much time you have for a specific topic yep. and this is also this is also something that you can use in order to in order to plan your studying journey okay yep definitely so number four study a lot more than you think you should and where I'm, what I mean by that is, you know, you might think that you're smarter than the average person, you know, if you ask if you ask a, a room full of people if they think they are better drivers than the average, more than 50% of them is going to say yes. Are you a better driver? Than <laughs> of course. Than of course I am. Obviously. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so assume that you're dumber than, 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 than the average person. And I used to, I mean, I, I know I'm a pretty average guy. So what I told myself back in the day is, okay, what is my edge? I, I, you know, I, I consider myself average, you know, there is nothing really that makes me grasp the, the materials better. I wasn't working in the industry when I started, when I took CFA level one, I was still in college. So I didn't have an edge. So I thought, okay, how can I improve my chances of passing? And for me, the answer was study more than everyone else. And that's what I did. You know, people talk about studying between 200 and 300 hours for each level. I think I studied 450 hours at least for each one of them, even for level one. 
And if you're studying a whole lot more than everyone else, chances are you're probably more prepared than, than, than the rest of the people. And if you think about the opportunity cost of not passing one exam, it's not only the psychological blow that you get when you receive that email, you're, you're banned eight, nine, or 10, but also you have to wait another year to study again. And for me, that was a lot more costly than studying, you know, another, an extra month. So, I would tell everybody, study a whole lot more than you think you should. Number five, focus on the process rather than on product. What I mean is focus on something that you can control, which is your effort, rather than what you cannot, which is, for example, how quickly you can finish your study chapter. So you can say to yourself, I'm going to study for 10 minutes today. And that's controllable. You can you can sit down and study for 10 minutes. You don't know if you're going to be able to read a page or two, but you know that you'll be sitting down and studying for 10 minutes. And once you you sit down and you do what you you wanted to do, you feel a sense of accomplishment, and that's that's always a good thing. So focus on the process, not on the product. Number six, don't be stingy. What I mean is. If you think you need additional aids for passing the exams, for example, if you think you need the Schweizer notes or any other service provider, if you think you need videos or a three-day seminar close to the exam, uh, mock exams, uh, there's plenty of stuff out there. If you think you need it, I would highly recommend you to go ahead and get it. It might cost you a bit more, and of course, you know, I know that people have... Uh, different budgets, but I would highly recommend you to find all the tools that you think you need in order to to pass the exam. And I would always, I would always assume, I would always be conservative. I would always think, okay, I, I understand the the material, but maybe watching videos would be helpful. I mean, I'm a person that loves watching videos. I mean, I learn by watching. I don't learn by reading and listening to. So I knew that I would I, I was good at understanding and grasping material when I watched someone explain it to me rather than than reading the books. So for me it was an easy call to just say I need the Kaplan Schweizer videos and I of course I didn't pay for it by the way and a lot of people that are working will have their exam materials and and exam fees uh, sponsored by the employee which is a great thing. So that makes the decision even easier. Also, as a side note, at least for my Kaya examination, I found the videos to be very helpful, not only because they show you, they give you the content, but also because they give you a general idea where you stand in comparison to, to other people and in which week you are, because the content is divided by weeks, depending on your study program. So this sort of gives you a benchmark where you should be by now in your studying program and where you are. So sometimes you just have to spend some time catching up and sometimes you can take a few days off. Uh, so this is a great benchmark to, exactly, to show yeah. you where you stand. That's true. That's true. All right, let's move on. Number seven, when in doubt, choose active learning. Active learning means trying to do exercises for example you know you you've you've read a chapter and you go to the end of the book and you work through the problems or you sit down with a piece of paper in front of you and you try to remember what you've just read and just write down what you in your with your own words what you think you you learned and that is active versus passive passive is watching a video or just reading the book there is a lot to be gained from trying to rephrase what you've read or what you've, you've watched. So if you have 30 minutes or 10 minutes and you don't know what you should do, I would always go for active learning rather than passive learning. All right, number eight. Well, for number eight, I thought I would give you guys some learning techniques that I used during my study efforts. So the first thing is, before you even start reading a chapter, what you can do is to go through the table of contents, open the book, go through the table of contents, and then if, once you're in the chapter, you can skim through it for a minute or two. Just, just look at the title, see what the titles say, go to the graphs, look at the graphs, look at the title of the graphs, see if you can understand the graphs. Uh, the tables, the, the formulas, maybe go to the back of the book and see the, the summary of the chapter before you even start reading it. And what that will do, it will 
sort of prime your brain to what is to come. And you'll be able to understand and grasp and retain a lot more information than you would if you, if you, if you didn't do that. So it will actually save you time too. The other thing I would tell you is when you're reading, first of all, don't treat your book like it's Mona Lisa, you know, <laughs> treat your book like it's a work in progress, not a finished product. So as you're reading, I would make notes everywhere. I mean, if you looked at my books after a month, I started reading them. It would look like it's, it's a 10 year old book. So just write on the side of the page. Don't just regurgitate what was on the page. Try to write it down in your own words, what you just read. And that's really helpful for retaining information. The other thing I would say is be very cautious with highlighting. And I think Luke has a different opinion on that. Than I, I'm, <laughs> I'm with you on this one. That I used to highlight everything and then I found out that uh, everything is important. But the biggest problem with highlighting for me was that if I highlighted something and then went back, I skipped the parts that were not highlighted. And these were very often very important parts. Exactly. I had the same problem. I mean, I, I used to be a... a a highlighter, uh, a, a highlighter. <laughs> <laughs> and then you realize okay what's the point of highlighting if i'm just skipping over imp information that's actually going to be uh, important to to know in the future so be very cautious of your highlighting and the other thing i wanted to tell you is about this is from a book i read i can't remember the name but it was about the psychology and the, the science of learning and the author talked about the two different modes of thinking, the, the focused mode and the, and the diffuse mode of thinking. The focus mode is, as the name says, when you're learning, when you're sitting down, focused on a task, trying to understand it. That's the focus mode. And the diffuse mode is what your brain does when you're not focused on your task. So your brain is working in the background at all times, even if you're not consciously thinking about a specific problem, your brain is working in the background and trying to sort of glue all that information together that you've just learned. So the diffuse mode of thinking happens when you're, for example, you're going for a walk or if you're, you know, taking a shower, uh, even listening to music, exercising. So why is it important? It's important that you give yourself enough time to do both, to, to, to use your focus mode and your diffuse mode of thinking. Because the diffuse mode, as I said, serves as a glue that glues all the information together. So one doesn't exist without the other. So make, a make, a, make, a, make sure you give yourself breaks, make, a sh make sure you go for walks, you know, take three to five minute breaks in between study efforts. We're going to be talking about some tools that we can use to do that uh, later on, but make sure you give yourself enough slack. And I think that's, uh, that's going to be uh, important. Number nine, I already touched on that. Uh, so we just, I would just read it and skip over it. Treat your books like a work in progress rather than a finished product. And there's a quote from Albert Einstein that I wrote down and he said, if you cannot explain it simply, you don't know it well enough. If you just read a chapter and you're trying to write down in your own words what you just learned and you can't, that means you don't understand it well enough. That's simple, as simple as that. So, number num 10. Number 10. Very simple and quick one. Change the scenery. What I mean is try to change the places where you study. You know, don't always study in the same library. Don't always study in your room or at work. Try to find a different restaurant or a, a, a Starbucks or whatever it is, a park. Try to find different places to study. And, and I think that was very helpful for me back in the day. Um, Luke, I think you're, you agree with that. We've talked about it before. Yeah, on my side, on my side, the same thing. I found it very stimulating. I would even, at one point, I, I couldn't stay in my room. I would just go to random cafes around the, around the city and just, just study. Also, the lack of, you know, not bringing your laptop, sometimes it's a, it's a great idea, actually. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I remember I used to go to uh, Borders. Wow. Borders. Yeah, Borders was, well, it's a company that doesn't exist anymore, but it was a very big bookstore in the U.S. Oh, right. And they went bankrupt because of... People like you. Yeah, that buy <laughs> books online, exactly. 
<laughs> and they had a a, 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 a a cafe in there, and I would go in on, on on the weekends, and sometimes I would find people with the CFA books, and it would make me so excited that I wasn't the only <laughs> one wasting my weekend <laughs> studying for for the CFA. So, so let's go to eleven. Take care of the hardware. What I mean here is make sure that you get enough sleep, and that you get enough exercise. Uh, people have different needs for sleep. Some people sleep less. Some people need more. I don't need a lot of sleep. Between six and a half and seven hours for me should be enough. But some people need nine hours. So make sure whatever your sleeping needs are, make sure you, you try to achieve them every single day. And the other thing is exercise. Exercise is important not only for your well-being. You know, you're probably going to be a much happier person if you have a, an exercising habit. But also for your 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 cognitive abilities, you know, you you you're gonna feel like you're much more active and you understand things and you grasp things a whole lot easier. So, also on on that point, I believe there was a book that you actually recommended to me, the Essentialism. There was a chapter about how sleep used to be lack of sleep would be something that people would brag about. Like I just slept three hours yesterday. Okay. And this this has been changing recently in our in our society, and people are sort of acknowledging more and more that sleep is an important part of your cognitive functioning, and you can't be just going into the office as a zombie every day. And uh, this, I feel very strongly about this that sleep is a strong part of of your study schedule. Yeah, and I think lack of sleep is sort of like being busy these days you know everyone brags about being busy and about not having slept enough that's so true yeah you can be very busy and yet not do much you know that's true exactly so uh, number 12 if you're still keeping track find a study group or a study partner or both i did not take my own advice up until i was studying for cfa level three so for level three I did two things. So the, I went on analyst forum, and some of you would be familiar with 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 that forum. You go in there, and there are people that ask questions about, "Hey, how should I prepare for uh, for the econ part or whatever?" And I went in there and I asked, "Hey, I'm I'm about to prepare for the CFA level three exam, and I would like to find a study group that could help me along the way." So I found three people. Who, they were all over the place. I used to live in the U.S. back in the day. One of them was in Canada. The other one was in Seychelles. And the other one was also in the U.S., in New York. And we met every single week on Mondays for two hours. And what we did is we would sit down and we'd prepare beforehand questions. So we would, we would say, okay, this week we're going to be studying, I don't know, readings 10 to 15. And we would prepare questions so that we could, could uh, quiz each other. So every week, one person was responsible for quizzing the others. So this week, I would prepare the questions, and I would ask you, okay, so what is so-and-so? And you try to answer in the best way possible. And every week, we would alternate that. And that was a great way to grasp the information because people say, you know, you learn by teaching. And as you're explaining a concept, you realize that you understand it a whole lot better afterwards. So it was extremely important. I highly recommend everyone to find a study group. Now, study groups can be a great way to procrastinate too. So you have to do it the right way. So make sure your study group has a structure. You know exactly when it's going to start. You know when it's going to end. You have a, uh, you know, okay, the first 30 minutes, we're going to be doing this. Know exactly the topics that you're going to be talking about. Keep the the small talk to a minimum. And then at the end, I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, your weekend or whatever, feel free to do that later. Actually, the three people that I had this study group with, they are still friends today. We still keep in touch and they're, they're great people. And I, I owe, I think I, I owe a big part of, of my success in level three to them. And the other thing I did was, I had a, a colleague at work who was, he was one level ahead of me. So I started that when I was in level two, actually. So I was studying for level two, he was studying for level three. And our cubicles were right next to one another. So we would see each other for eight hours a day at least. And during lunch, we would 
quiz each other. So I would take a level three book, open on a random page, and I would ask him, give me this formula. Uh, if, I mean, if he got it wrong, then we would, you know, say, hey, give me a dollar or whatever it is. I don't remember exactly the uh, reward that we assigned for, for getting something right. And so that, that was really helpful too, because it, it keeps you, it, it keeps you motivated. It's fun. You know, it's a fun way to, to learn. Yeah. So find a study group or find a partner, or if you have the time, uh, both. Okay. Let's move on to 13. Take your books with you everywhere you go. You have to have the books with you because I am of the belief that you need to study every single day. Some people like to take breaks, but even if you have five minutes or 10 minutes, make sure you have a book with you and open it because it's, I found it very important to stay in touch with the curriculum at all times so that you feel like you're part of it and it's part of you. At some point you, you start missing your, your material. So, so make sure you keep your books with you at all times. If you're taking the train somewhere, if you're in a plane somewhere, or, um, I don't know, you're at a doctor's office and you have 15 minutes of waiting time, just open the book and try to read something. Um, so 14, don't let your ego get the best of you. And I wrote down a quote from Thomas Edison, and he said, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. I remember hating making mistakes, when, I, especially when I was doing mock exams. You know, you do a mock exam, you sit for six hours and you realize you got a 55 percent and you're two weeks away from the exam it's very frustrating what i'm trying to tell you is whenever you find that there is an area that you're not good at that you've made consistent mistakes over time just focus on that you know instead of going back to oh, your your equity analyst you go back and do your equity exercises uh, every day so that you can feel good about yourself don't do that go to the areas that you're the weakest at and try to improve on that so don't get don't let your ego get the best of you that's what i mean there focus on your weakest points and if you you know if you keep making mistakes you know just keep on trying to you know do more mock exams study more you know try to do something to change it instead of feeling depressed for not ha having achieved a grade that you expected. Number 15, make sure you have a support system around you. And this is extremely important. I don't care if you are single, you live with your parents, if you have a girlfriend or a wife, if you have a family. If, if you think you can do it alone, you're wrong because the CFA exam is going to take a toll on your time. So you're not going to be hanging out with your friends anymore as much. You're not going to be spending a lot of time with your family or with your girlfriend or whomever it is. So make sure that they know what you're up to. Make sure that they understand the importance of, of this exam for you for whatever reason. And make sure they understand the amount of time that you need to, uh, to prepare. Because if they don't, they will start questioning why you're not spending time with them. My girlfriend at the time, my wife now, she was weirdly supportive. She would ask me to study on Sundays rather than asking me to stop studying. And I studied a lot, like I said, so I credit a lot of my success in the CFA exam to, to her. If you're listening, honey, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> Number 16. And we're almost done here. I thought I would put together a list of things that you can do to beat procrastination, you know. And as we're living in a connected world with iPhones and, and iPads and, and computers everywhere and people sending you tweets and, and messages, and it's, it's getting a whole lot harder to stay focused on a task. So... There is a, a quote, another quote uh, from Seth Godin this time, and he said, it's always the hard part that creates value. So you need to, whenever you're studying, you need to make sure you shut everything off. You know, just stay focused on your books, turn off your computer, your phone, everything. So, yeah, and turn off your distractions. And there are some tools. I mean, there are a bunch of tools online that can help you. Uh, stay focused. I think Lucas is, is the is the CTO of the Wall Street Lab, so he's the te most technological savvy person. 
So I think you, you'd be able to help us. It's, I personally found it pretty great. I know that there are other tools uh, like this. This The tool that we're currently talking about is a Chrome extension that you can install in, into your Chrome browser. And there are different iterations for different different browsers that allow you to block certain websites that you usually go to. And it's actually pretty amazing how often you catch yourself going to YouTube or to or to Facebook without even thinking about this. You would be studying, you would not think about this, you would just click on the YouTube page and boom, you get a you got a message that the website is blocked and this is the moment where you where you wake up and you oh no, I should be I should be studying at this moment. What right. am I doing? So even if you think you have self control, this just comes up time and again. And this tool, I believe, just helps you stay concentrated. You can set up a time for how long you want to block these websites and you can set your own list of websites that distract you. So if you're distracted by Reddit, you can block Reddit. If you're distracted by Facebook, you block Facebook, you block all of them. Uh, unfortunately, there are a few easy fixes. If you if you really want to go go through to your to check your Facebook every 10 minutes, you can do it via incognito mode. Mm. And yeah, I know that there are a few more sophisticated tools, but I think this beats the purpose of just of just staying focused. There are mm -hmm. also gamified systems for this. So there are even there are even applications that would allow you to get points for each minute you spend on the creative task and each minute that you spend on Facebook deducts the points. So if you want to wow, get more okay. into gamification of of your studying program, this is something you can do as well. Yeah, and uh, by the way, we're going to link up all these all these tools to the show notes, so make sure to check those out. There is one that I know um, I've used for ghost setting, and it's a website called stick.com uh, with two Ks, and it's really helpful. Um, you know, I won't get into the details here. Just go check them out, and um, I think you're going to like it. And the other the other tool that I would also emphasize is uh, the Pomodoro technique, and it. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's, I don't know the background. It's, I know it's probably an Italian person who created it, but basically you study, you set a clock so that you can study for 25 minutes and then you take five minutes break, or it can be less or more. But what that allows you to do is to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to be focused for 25 minutes and I'm not going to let anything distract me. And as a reward at the end, I'm going to spend five minutes doing whatever it is you want to do. I'll go outside, I'll grab a coffee, I'll surf the internet, whatever it is. And there is, if you go on Google, if you Google Pomodoro technique or, or Pomodoro clock online, you can find it very easily. And instead of saying, I'm going to study for three hours today, I'm going to do, you can say, I'm going to do uh, four Pomodoros or something. <laughs> um, it's really helpful. I mean, it sounds, it sounds uh, funny, but it, it, it's definitely a helpful tool. It sounds like food. <laughs> <laughs> Pomodoro means tomato in Italian, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Also, there is one more technique that you could be using. I think this could be considered the most, the most painful on some level and probably the most effective technique. This is what Leo, what you mentioned previously about uh, accountability and how you can, uh, oh, was this the stick platform that? Yes, mentioned? stick, yeah. yeah, sticks allows you to choose a, uh, an account accountability partner that checks on your progress. Right, so you've just, you've just donated uh, because yes. was it? you were not studying once and you donated it, $25 to a charity that you it really wasn't. did not support. Exactly, so, so what stick.com allows you to do is to set negative goals so you can say i'm gonna donate ten dollars if i don't uh, exercise three times a week and for every week that you don't reach your goals you're going to be donating those ten dollars to a specific cause and they give you a, a range of options of places where you can donate your money you know i don't know some health organization but there are also some organizations that you might not agree with that you can donate to, and that serves as its own motivation to to keep on focused on your task. But as Luke mentioned, I I donated twenty five dollars to to an organization that 
I do not agree with. I'm not going to say it here because I know that there are people that probably support that organization, but it's needless to say that I definitely regret not reaching my, my goal that week. <laughs> and you can only, I think the point is you can only get your money back or the deposit that you've put up if your accountability partner says, yes, he has reached his goals. And when he says no, then you donate the money towards an organization of your choosing. Exactly. We recommend we recommend donating to uh, dog shelters and similar uh, <laughs> similar organizations, <laughs> as every one of us will probably have this have this moment <laughs> yeah. at one point. Exactly. Let's just jump into to point seventeen. Is it? Yeah, yeah seventeen. Oh, we're pretty far along. Yeah, we're we're very close to the end. So hang in there. Uh, and by the way, I'll repeat the 18 points very quickly at the end so that you keep those in mind. And of course, we're going to keep those, we're going to link up those. Uh, in the show notes. In the sh that. Yeah, exactly. So 17, don't overdo online forums. It's a very quick one. I mean, if you go to an online forum about any sort of exam, the CFA exam is not is no different. You, you realize that everyone sounds a whole lot smarter than you in there. Everyone sounds like they, you know, they got a 95% on their mock exam and they finished it in two hours, uh, everyone is going to sound like they're doing a whole lot better than you. I mean, if it's true or not, I don't know. But some people get depressed by by that. Do you remember the GMAT times when, when you were taking the GMAT like a long time ago? I yeah. think this was the time when I was when I was when I spent the majority of my time looking at forums and everyone was like, I got seven fifty, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And <laughs> I just felt so bad, you know, preparing and doing these tests and not arriving at that ninety something percentile. It seems like every everyone knows everything on the online forums, but when you really look the percentages at who gets these results, it's like less than one exactly, percent of yeah. people, less than one percent. I, I don't know the statistics, yeah. so don't quote me on that. Yeah, and I mean, surfing the internet is, I mean, and forums are no different. You know, it's a it's a way to procrastinate too. Our forum will be different. Because our forum will be different because reasons. No, but I mean, even even if it's our own, you know, don't overdo them. You know, if you have a question, you know, be happy. You know, we can come to ours at some point, or you can go back to Alan uh, Analyst Forum. But just make sure that you don't let the comments on the forum distract you from what you're trying to do. So exactly, just do your best, and uh, things will work out. Yeah. Okay. We yeah. reached the last one. Uh, and the last one, the 18th point is believe in yourself. Uh, and that's probably the most important point of all. Uh, if, if you don't believe that you can, you can pass the exams, I mean, of course, it's not, it's not easy. It's the, the content of the CFA exams, they're not difficult. It's just a lot of it. You know, there's a lot to study. Now, for every, for every level, you have to study th six books. Uh, there's a lot of material in there, but it's not rocket science. I believe that anyone can do it. And knowing that you you have the the potential to pass and you have full control over your your efforts is a powerful thing. So make sure you instill that belief in yourself before you even start. Don't let anyone distract you from it. Don't let every, anyone else try to say, yeah, you know, I... I I study for three weeks and I passed, you know, more often than not, those people are either not telling the truth or they actually studied before. So make sure you believe in yourself. All right. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I think that went, that went pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I hope it wasn't too long for you guys. I, I would, we would really uh, appreciate your feedback on on this episode uh it's it was something completely different i enjoyed doing it because i think uh, you know if, if if you've done something and it was successful i think it's important to share it with the world and that's probably the reason why we started uh, the wall street lab so let me just before we we, f we finish let me just go back to the points very quickly so that you you remember them so number one understand your why number two create a study habit number three Plan your study journey to the smallest detail. Number four, study a lot more than you think you should. Number five, focus on progress rather than product. Number six, don't be stingy. Number seven, when in doubt, choose active learning. Number eight was a list of learning techniques that we provided. Number nine, 
Treat your books as a work in progress rather than a finished product. Number 10, change the scenery. Number 11, take care of your hardware. 12, find a study group and or a study partner. 13, take your books with you everywhere you go. 14, don't let your ego get the best of you. Number 15, make sure you have a support system around you. 16 was a list of things you can do and techniques that you can use to beat procrastination. 17, do not overdo online forums. And finally, 18, believe in yourself. Yeah, that, All was, right. that was great. Thanks, Leo. And if you got to this point, and <laughs> if you are still listening... <laughs> I would I would like to thank you very much for for being a listener and um, also if you have one minute please feel free to go to iTunes and leave us a, a nice review as it really helps us to to grow the show and reach more people definitely and sorry Luke if uh, just one last thing also if if you have any questions about the CFA exams I I, I love talking about it uh, so just shoot us an email to contact at thewallstreetlab.com and we'll make sure to answer your question as quickly as we can. Thank you very much, Luke, yeah, for listening to, to me uh, talk for an hour about the CFA exams. It was great. Let's do it again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, have a great day. And uh, that's been it. Thank you, guys. Let's stay in touch. Thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast. For the show notes and much more, visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com. To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not be treated as investment, tax, financial or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.